Hello, and welcome to our presentation, Japanese American Artifacts Are Not Your Collectibles, hosted by the Minidoka Pilgrimage Planning Committee. In recent years, we have seen an increase of camp-related artifacts and objects being sold, monetized, and commercialized, both online and at brick-and-mortar auctions. We have also seen community members objecting to these objects being peddled for profit without regard for the trauma and pain behind their creation and the lack of documented provenance and no clear ownership history provided. My name is Biff Brigman and I am co-chair of the Minidoka Pilgrimage Planning Committee. And currently I'm the unofficial genealogist and researcher for the Minidoka Pilgrimage Committee. I'd like to introduce today our guests. We have Kim Leroy and Lori Matsumura, community members who will be sharing the story of them attempting to reclaim precious objects that came from their families and somehow have no longer been with them. I'd also like to introduce Nancy Yukai, world famous historian and researcher and co-founder of the 50 Objects Project. I encourage everyone to check that project out. And finally, we have Kimmy Komar, filmmaker extraordinaire and co-founder of Japanese American Memorial Pilgrimages, or JAMP. And we thank her for her help, both in getting today's program going, but also her support of the Minidoka Pilgrimage overall and joining us for this discussion. If you have camp objects and aren't sure what to do with them or are trying to identify originating families, please contact us at the Minidoka Pilgrimage and we will work with you to try and help identify good locations or to track down families. We know that community members are currently working on a list of potential organizations for donations and places that may be good homes for these artifacts. And so please keep in touch and we can help get that list to you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Nancy Ukai. I'm project director of 50 Objects. And um, today I'll be talking about Japanese American history, not for sale, three community protests, which objected to the sale and commodification of Japanese American World War II concentration camp artifacts. And the three protests I'm going to talk about are the Rego auction, um, which occurred in 2015, the Kitaji Bibles, which um, the sale of that was stopped in 2017, and the Matsumura drawings on eBay, which were made at Manzanar, that was in 2021. And the three um, images you see on the right-hand side are from those three auctions. Um, the Rego auction um, was taking place in 2015, and um, it was the Rego firm, which is in New Jersey, was going to sell some 450 artifacts, which were so, which were collected by Alan Eaton. Alan Eaton was a well-known author and scholar of um, of crafts. He was working in the Russell Sage Foundation in New York, and um, he wrote the most uh, seminal book on crafts in the camps called Beauty Behind Barbed Wire. It was based on his visiting um, five of the World War II WRA camps in 1945 as the camps were closing. And in correspondence that he wrote in October 1st, 1945, he talked about the fact that in addition to going to Amachi, Topaz, Minidoka, and Heart Mountain, I was able to get to Thule Lake. So we know that he went to Minidoka sometime in the autumn of 1945. And this is a map of the WRA camps and also the assembly centers and also DOJ and um, immigration and naturalization service camps during world war ii the orange circles are the camps that alan eaton visited in 1945 the ones circled in blue are the ones that he didn't and of course minidoka is there in yellow in um, the southeastern corner of idaho when he collected things he wanted to make a documented report photographically and also to collect um, the physical artifacts as a display because he felt that um, what people were doing with very scarce materials um, under great oppression, racism, having all of their belongings taken was, was astonishing. And he found when he visited the five camps, he wrote in his book, they offered to give me things to the point of embarrassment, but not to sell them. 
what happened when he did try and sell them was people came to this quote in his book and said, you are violating the premise of his own beliefs about when he was collecting things. So I'm going to show you now a few things that he might have, that he definitely did see at Minidoka. And um, this isn't to say that these were for sale, but we know that he documented them because he saw them and published them in his book, Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, which was published in 52, 10 years after Executive Order 9066 was issued by President Roosevelt. So here's a stone that looks like it's in the shape of a rabbit. And um, these are photographed, this photograph is from the Japanese American National Museum, um, a wood artifact, um, which has an amazing grain and a poem that is mounted on a panel with a nightingale on a plum tree, which is a very famous uh, motif in Japanese art history. Um, this photograph was in his book, Beauty Behind Barbed Wire, and it was he was astonished to see that somebody had decorated their barrack with so many artifacts, perhaps collected by this person. And here's the rabbit. And here's that wooden artifact. And here is not the exact same um, poetry, but a very similar thing. So this allows us to think about what Eaton was seeing when he was visiting the camps and the variety of artifacts that people were making. Um, this is a photograph of a Minidoka craft show. And you can see paintings, dolls, wooden artifacts. And I want you to pay attention to these two pieces of sagebrush or greasewood sculpture. Because in his book, um, Eaton was really so impressed and moved by how people um, took natural forms in the desert and, you know, saw within those a bird and, and really did very little to change it and just had this very deep appreciation for, for um, nature and the gnarled wood that they found, perhaps polishing it. One doctor um, had this collection of walking sticks. And then um, he said on about the right-hand side, that artifact that except, except for the fact that they might have sanded the head a little bit and then cut off the feet that this piece of um, wood was found and then just basically appreciated for what it was. And then finally, um, one person who was uh, either a bonsai or some sort of florist used the uh, sagebrush and greasewood to make a beautiful um, composition at Minidoka. Um, also a butsudan from Minidoka and um, beautiful carving that apparently the carver told Eaton they weren't good enough to be in a display. So this is just to show you the kinds of things Eaton saw and photographed. They might have been in his collection, we don't know, but this is why there was such surprise, anger, outrage, when in 2015 in March, um, members of the community saw in this art blog in the New York Times that Eaton's collection would go to auction, about 450 artifacts. Um, and then in particular, statements like this, this was made by an unknown artist. Well, it was maybe unknown to Eaton. He might not have put the name down and it may not have been known to the auction house, which was consigned to sell these things. But certainly a little work and research on the part of the community would show that we we know who these people are. These are our family members. These are our community members. And so after that New York Times blog article was published on March 5th, three weeks later, an online catalog and a paper catalog came out and people started recognizing themselves. They started seeing names of, of on nameplates, barrack nameplates, and just generally the outrage and the confusion and the anger started to build. And basically when we saw that there were 24 auction lots, which had been, you know, divided. So in an auction, they would say lot number 1232, paintings by Estelle Ishigo, this is the price, what do I hear? And then they would just hammer through um, this sequence of lots. So seeing all of these artifacts divided into 24 lots, um, numbered with a price tag, and basically descriptions we felt were insulting because these were objects of tragedy and they were born from oppression and racism and people losing so much was just really uh, a moment of grief, anger. And then what the question is, what do we do? So 
a group of um, people in Northern California, and I was among them, just got on a conference call in um, April and said, you know, what should we do? Some of these things are artworks like paintings. Those are sold in auction. But other things like nameplates, those seem to have been taken off the barracks after people had left. We know that he said people gave me things but not to sell them. And so at any rate, the idea was, you know what, if these things get sold, we will have done nothing. Something must be done. And so this group, just an ad hoc group, set up a Facebook page called Japanese American History Not for Sale and opened up a change.org petition and um, wrote a community letter. But it was a social media that really took off. And within one week, basically, thousands of people, 8,000 people signed the change.org petition and um, an equal number signed on to the Japanese American history not for sale. This was in 2015, and it was really astonishing to see how much people made memes, signed up, and the change.org people said this was one of our favorite campaigns because it was such a good cause, and almost everybody who signed had a comment to make. They didn't just sign it. They actually said, my parents were at this camp. And, and for example, in the bottom corner here, one person wrote, on the change.org petition. I remember the hardships my parents faced in scraping together a semblance of civilized life while in those prison camps. The artifacts should not be turned in commodities of trade. Reverend Oshta of, San, of excuse me, Sacramento wrote, to those connected with the auction, the drawings, paintings, photographs, and crafts created by those of Japanese ancestry in prison during World War II are not pieces of art meant to decorate a private collection. They are deep and quiet expressions of the hope and despair felt by a people enduring the trauma of racism, hatred, and fear. What you are planning to sell should be part of our shared social conscience and not viewed as simply art for display. So meanwhile, the Heart Mountain Wyoming Foundation had been investigating legal action. Um, people, the press had really picked up on this story. Two days before the auction was to be held on April 17th, the Rego um, company, suspended the auction and um, it was actually a story that was on the front page of the New York Times. Um, it really caught people's imagination. It's not the only time obviously that groups have protested the sale of objects of tragedy in their history. You know, obviously Holocaust items, African American items related to slavery, Native American grave artifacts, all of these things have been, the sale has been contested. But I think for Japanese Americans, it was a watershed moment. And so I'd like to just mention, talk about a little bit about terminology and how thinking about the option, the auction and how our artifacts were being framed as Asian decorative art. So these panels here were made from discarded orange crates using tools made of discarded metal. And to call these decorative art just it felt so insulting. And the fact that the sellers had no appreciation for exactly why they were made, how they came to be, and why they should not be sold to the highest bidder. And so I think that framing the objects as art tends to equate them with commodities and not really think about them as wartime objects that prompt memory and represent survival. Beautiful things can be used to mask a tragic history. And then the human stories become submerged to the visual and without stories and without being able to know who made them, without provenance trail, which these Rego artifacts did not have, viewers are left to project their own narrative. And so the importance of knowing who made them tracing them back to the original people, knowing what their family story is, is absolutely important and something that we felt that the um, Eaton descendants, Eaton had died, his daughters had died, and the people who were consigning these objects to auction were in Greenwich, Connecticut, and um, had just said to Rago, can you sell these? So the objects were really taken away from, ripped apart from their original origin and creation story. This small um, watercolor here, which is the size of a postcard, Rago um, described it as Asian fine art. And as we remember in the New York Times article, it was described as being done by an unknown artist. Well, actually it was done by a 16 year old named George Tamura. He did it at Tule Lake and he made these small postcard size watercolors of the Tule Lake area on the back of exclusion orders. And on um, the PBS program, History Detectives in 2004, they tracked George down and they said, why did you paint on the back of evacuation notices? 
And George was astonished to open the door and find these um, reporters there. But he said, it was hard to get anything in the camp there, even pieces of paper. I had to put down an image of what it was like there, my personal feeling. I don't know why I didn't put people in there. It was probably because I felt it was simply no place for people to be living there at that time. So I think that stopping the auction really showed that by people protesting, giving voice and claiming ownership and reclaiming artifacts that their family members, their community members made, and allies who were sympathetic to our cause realized that we needed to be able to trace these artifacts back to the people who made them to get these stories like George's. He was not an unknown artist. He had a name, and the story of them is really important. And so that was why it was important for them not to, you know, just be anonymously held by a stranger. They are now, the entire Eaton collection is now at the Japanese American National Museum. So interestingly, two years later, something called the Kitaji Bibles came up for private sale and by Swan Galleries in New York. And actually the reason why this became known to the community was a direct result of the Rego auction. And um, people, institutions were getting private invitations to bid on these two Bibles, which were bound and printed Bibles that an Issei, an immigrant man from Wakayama Prefecture, had um, illustrated while he was incarcerated at Poston, partially. These two Bibles were quite magnificent things because they were covered and they had leather covers and the work in them was quite astonishing. The person who made them, Masuo Kitaji, had um, made these annotations for himself and when he taught people about Bible teachings. He wanted to have his own interpretation in Japanese, but he was also an artist and made drawings. These Bibles were going to be sold for $85,000. Somebody from an institution wrote to me actually and said, I think this is just like the Rego auction. These things should be in the community and not for private sale. Um, I happen to know a Kitaji and I talked to my friend Sharon Noguchi and I said, do you know how we can get in touch with them? And she did. Within I would say a month, I don't remember exactly how long it was, um, the Bibles were able to reclaim their, um, their priceless family artifact. And um, what happened was within several days of finding out that the Bibles were no longer in the possession of the family, it's a large family and they thought somebody else had them. They hadn't realized that um, somebody, the, the Swan Gallery had been able to acquire them and that whole story is rather complicated and won't go into the details. But at any rate, um, this family said, you know, you could have, they said to the auctioneer, you could have contacted us. Our names are in written in this Bible because when we were baptized, our names were written into it. And um, within three days of finding out that their family Bibles were going to be sold by this gallery, more than 30 family members wrote a letter saying, please um, allow us to have our historical object back. Um, the family was able to acquire them and the, the artifacts are now in the collection. They're in a vault actually at the Hoover Institute at Stanford University. The family was able to retain the intellectual property rights for um, copying them and they have the files, but the actual physical artifact is in Stanford. And um, what's that has permitted is the, um, this before they went to Stanford, the family was able to display them um, at the public library in Gilroy. And in the center there is um, Laura dominguez Yon, who was the person who really um, led the charge on this. And on the, her t the person on the right is Brian Taba, who was a grandnephew of Captain Kitaji. He was, um, associated with the Sal Salvation Army. And um, anyway, it's been an incredible story of the family mobilizing and getting together and um, reclaiming this important part of their history. And now the Japanese American National Museum will be holding an exhibition called Sutra and Bible, and the Bibles will be featured, and that will be in the fall of 2021 and the spring, I believe, in 2022. So my third um, topic, which I'll briefly cover, is the um, auction of um, Manzanar drawings made by an artist named Matsumura. Quickly, the community was able to mobilize when on eBay, it was seen that these drawings were made by a community member at 
at Manzanar. And so this is a screenshot of the auction on eBay. It was in early April. And by the time that the bidding was going up and it actually had reached over $400, Immediately, though, the community was able to mobilize, thanks to actually all of the networks that had been made since the Rego auction, the Japanese American Confinement Site Consortium had been created partly as an outcome of the Rego auction. And so there was this large umbrella group, gee, I'm not even sure how many, probably 200 people on the list, or not people, organizations, including JCLs, museums, nonprofits. And so... In the Rego auction, people just kind of signed on to social media, but this time we were all together and were able to produce a letter um, within really one day. More than 100 national organizations, 100 organizations signed on, 59 individuals to eBay saying, please take down these artifacts and please don't commodify our World War II heritage objects. A change.org petition was started and you know, a few thousand people signed on quite quickly what happened was through um, David E. Noe, who is the executive director of the JCL, we were able to um, get an introduction to eBay because um, Anti-Defamation League had been negotiating with them on prohibiting the sale of Holocaust artifacts. We were able to meet with two eBay officials on the day of the auction's closing, and they agreed, and, and as well, um, Lori Matsumura, who is the um, family member whose drawings were, you know, she believes to be in her family, also got on the call and they agreed to take them down. And so Lori tells her family story in another interview, which um, you'll be seeing. And um, her grandfather had died at Manzanar um, in 1945 on a hike. She believes that those drawings were done by her father. The social media was up. This is, um, I thought, a very powerful um, meme that was created. Lori talking to a reporter about her father's artwork. This just shows a few pieces of the art. And one of the uh, pieces of evidence to um, show eBay and also the person who was selling them was that the signature on the drawings that are dated 1942 and Manzanar was to show her father's Manzanar High School graduation certificate with his name. And she feels that the signature is quite close and she has other documents to show that. And so you can see on the bottom right hand side, there's another um, signed drawing. And at present, the negotiations are still underway with the seller. Thank you very much for listening. We'll, I'll just end on the fact that 50 Objects, which is a National Park Service Jacks Grant project, is something that I'm working on um, with David Izu. And we have a great team of videographers, including um, Emiko Omori and Kimiko Mar. And what we're doing is trying to explore the backstory of these artifacts, which may be in museums or in your family attic, in a garage, things that people might not be thinking that deeply about, but which have in them stories that we really must share and think about what kinds of stories these artifacts hold and not to think of them as something to sell or something to um, think about only as art, but as historical evidence and a prompt to memory and to sharing stories so that this history doesn't happen again. And I'll just mention that in the fall, 50 Objects will be exploring further the story of the Kitaji Bibles. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Lori Matsumura, and I'm a third generation Japanese American. My grandparents met in Japan. My grandfather is from Fukui, and my grandmother is from Kyoto. And they married in 1923. And shortly thereafter, they immigrated to the US where they, where they settled in the Santa Monica Canyon. They set up a Japanese community in their own home that they rented out. My grandmother, while she was going to school to learn English, she taught flower arranging and tea ceremony. My grandfather was a gardener. Once in the mid 1920s, they moved this type of com Japanese community to a new location in Santa Monica in the like 1927 or so. Then they were sent to the relocation camps in Manzanar during the war. Once there, my grandfather 
would like leave the camp and he would love to draw the landscape. He did watercolor, but one day it, there was an unexpected snowstorm and he died on the mountain. Um, and so they had to send a search team and eventually my, they sent another team when they found him <clears throat> to bury his body because they couldn't bring him down from the mountain. Most recently, they rediscovered his remains on Mount Williamson and um, brought his remains down. But during camp, my, my grandfather loved to do watercolor painting and my dad was also very artistic. He carved birds and painted them and he also did drawings and sketches. He was just, he loved to do art, even at a young age. When we went through our house, we found a lot of artwork that my dad did, even woodwork. He worked with metal. He did all airbrushing, just all kinds of different types of art. My grandmother, at the, in, her in her 70s, she took up Sumia, I think in 1996. That's when she stopped, at the age of 94, that's when she stopped doing her artwork. So I know that my sister loves to do art. So we, we, our family just is very artistic. And I think that's carried us through from our grandparents, even before, but we have no idea. Most recently, I received a message from Mr. Burton from the Manzanar Relocation Center and he asked me about some sketches that were being sold. He wanted to know, because the sketches being sold on eBay had the name Matsumura and Manzanar associated with it. Doing a little bit of research, I realized these were my dad's drawings. Right now, we are in the process of trying to get them back. I think it's painful to see my dad's sketches on eBay because those items belong to our family. And like a lot of families, when the war started, they had to um, burn old photographs and destroy things. It was done during a time where there was a lot of hardship. When the Japanese had to move into these relocation camps, they could only bring what they could carry. So that meant a lot of artifacts and a lot of family history were left behind. A lot of times they were looted and they were gone. Even cars, and we weren't allowed to own property then. So it's it makes me sad to think that after all this and someone trying to sell your family history right in front of you to make a profit is not right. I think that these sales, they need to know the provenance of an item. They need to stop it if they can't clarify where they receive these items and artifacts. Um, in the future, I would like to see more auction houses and just put more effort into stopping these sales. Going through this journey, it, it means so much more. The thought of having my family's artwork out there because I have no control what sellers may do, it makes me sad because I don't have control of if they sell it, if and it's in the wrong hands. And I want buyers, if that's going to happen, I want them to be aware of these stories and what it means to us and think twice about, about what you're doing or what you're buying because the painful experience my family had to go through and the fact that you're purchasing artwork that belonged to them during this time I don't, I buy artwork to bring me joy, something I wanna see, something that makes me happy. And to the buyer, if, it, if that happens, 
is that going to make you happy? Are the stories behind it going to bring you satisfaction? Because to you as an outsider, it's different, but to us, it means more. So I would like people to be aware of what they're purchasing and ask for the provenance. How did you get that? Where did you buy it? What about the family behind it? Do they not want it? Ask these questions. It's funny how all this is coming about during a time where Asians are being discriminated against, being physically harmed. I think that the Asian community, whether we're Chinese or Japanese or Korean, we're people and it's just absolutely wrong. But I'm glad that this has come at a time to bring awareness of, to touch on a subject on what happened in the past. The lesson I learned personally is I didn't quite understand what my family went through being incarcerated. It was always something I was told growing up, little bits of pieces here and there. They never really shared much information. It's, it's like they didn't really want to talk about it. So from the time they found my grandfather's body and having to go and do a DNA test, and I went to visit Manzanar to the museum for the first time, it just really put everything into perspective. And to stand there looking at the type of housing they lived in and where they ate and how desolate and isolated this place was, it just, it made me realize how hard that would that was that this happened to them that was my personal journey and now going through this problem with my dad's sketches being sold on ebay it's kind of like okay it hits me again because i know my my family my grandmother would never ever sell or give away my family's artwork she was very adamant about having these things stay in the family. If we, she knew if we wanted to donate them to the museum, that's fine. But she wanted these artifacts to remain with the next generation because they, she didn't have much. It wasn't, she didn't have a lot of memory she was able to keep. So these, these, artworks and and bird pins and it was so important and precious to her that she held on to them that long that's why it's so upsetting to see this happen i see connections and correlations to other people who are going through like the african americans and even the you know the the jewish people and Anything that was done under duress and people are taking advantage and selling them is absolutely wrong. I think that these objects should remain with the family. And if it cannot be, um, if it cannot remain with the family, I think they should be put in museums or in the care of, of where everyone can see them and it can be shared with everyone. My advice for um, other families who are going through this is to really, the Japanese community has been so great and so helpful and accepting, believe in them. They will back you up and they will guide you the great things about this is that I learned about more about the Japanese community and how helpful they are and that they stand behind you. I think that for other people who are non ek to what I want them to understand that about the hardships of what we went through and just more education and awareness, especially to the younger generation, because I don't really remember learning about this in school. 
it wasn't anything that was brought to attention about what about the history during World War II and what happened to the Japanese and Japanese Americans that lived here, how discriminated we were, that we weren't able to own property. We, it was um, not really taught to me. I only knew because of my family, but they didn't really want to discuss that. And so I'm, this is why when they found my grandfather's remains on Mount Williamson and it was in the paper, I'm happy to do these interviews and to bring awareness, to make the story continue so this does not happen in the future. We cannot let history repeat itself like this. Well, with these, with all these objects being around and sketches and artifacts, I know that once our generation passes on, what do we do with them? That's a big question. We can't, if there's one item, it has to be shared amongst everyone. So my thoughts were maybe doc you know take pictures and of course document the story behind it you know pass them to the next generation and that way they will know the family history everyone will have a copy of sketches drawings watercolors boxes that were made bird pins if the next generation maybe is not interested or which i don't see how they wouldn't be but donate them to the museum just preserve everything because there's a story behind all these objects, whether they're for my family or any family, any race, any background, there's a story behind what was made. And I think it's so important to preserve that and to let the people, let, let their voice be heard and let these stories continue. Um, my name is Kim Saranya Leroy. I am Sansi, Japanese American and Native American. Um, I am the third generation. So my great grandfather is Seizo Maximoto from Tacoma, Washington. So I'm the oldest of three children. Can you talk to us a little bit about your personal journey with genealogy and family? objects and archives? Yes. So um, genealogy and family archives came to me at a very young age. Um, I was very confused about who I was because being biracial, it's, it's a tug of who you are, where you belong, and what's your story. Um, that opened a door to me because I didn't have a story being Japanese American. All of my story had disappeared. Um, my great grandfather and great uncle were taken to the internment camps in um, Pouliot or the Pouliot Fairgrounds, and then they were taken to what is called Pinedale um, Assembly Camp. My great grandfather died there, and our story was lost after that. Our family belongings were stolen. Our ha our family home was ransacked, and left us with basically an open blank space. So that, knowing that little bit at a young age turned me on to genealogy and I began researching and made a promise to my grandmother very early on that I would create or complete the circle. I would find us and find our story again. And it's brought me here. And I, I'm still on that journey, but I'm almost done. Can you tell us a little bit about, you said something about your um, home being ransacked. Can you tell a little yes. bit about background on that? Um, when my great grandfather and great uncle were interned or imprisoned, they were taken from what was our family berry farm. They were out with other family members and family friends picking berries. They were taken by gunpoint in army trucks and they were taken to the Pouliot fairgrounds. They didn't have time to pack the two suitcases. They didn't have time to get anything other than to be in, interviewed and put in a truck. The family that was with them, that was in-laws, um, they actually followed later on to bring them suitcases with their belongings in it. Um, because of that, they had very little time to sell anything, to store anything, to hide anything. And it was left open. 
and there was a lot of dislike and just begrudging and hate basically at that time and our family home was ransacked things were taken belongings stolen um, memorabilia stolen and it was lost basically we had no way to get it back we had no way to reclaim it and with my great-grandfather dying in the internment camp um, my uncle was so ashamed of what had happened and his brother was in the Navy that there was no way to find a way for them to return those things my grandmother couldn't because she had small children and so our story was just basically gone everything um, and because of that I the invention of the internet helped out a lot I think um, I began researching very early on looking at places like dead Fred um, eBay and so on and so such just looking for a glimmer of hope den show just to see if I could find just maybe just the tiniest little piece of something and you know it took me a long time and it was you know every now and then you find something that said Maximode and you get excited and then it wasn't anything um, until one day I found Maximoto and it was something and it was a picture of my uncle and tell us about that I reached out to the person that was selling it um, it was a part of his private collection and I let him know that that was my family member I gave him our family history and asked him if he would work with me to return those artifacts those pictures because that was part of my family story and he had said that he had gotten them from another individual and had paid for them and he told me if I wanted them I could pay for them I told him that wasn't that wasn't agreeable to me you have stolen property you have things that don't belong to you you have my family story in your keeping just because we're Japanese American and that belongs to my family I'd like it back and we went back and forth back and forth and you know sometimes I thought oh he's wavering he's going to return that to me only to have him come back with a price again that if you want it you can pay for it well I have a legal background and you know two three years into this I said enough is enough and I decided I was going to take legal action and I sent him a certified letter stating you have stolen property you have things that were gained through ill-gotten ways and there are laws that I can intercede with and make you return these to me. He didn't believe me, so I sent another certified letter. And this time, I was following my P's and Q's, and I decided to cite the National Stolen Property Act, 18 U.S.C. 2314, segment citing the 2006 and 2000 amendment that says looted cultural foreign and domestic objects properties can be returned to proper parties when I cited that I told him he had one of two choices he could willingly return the, pay the products and the items to me that was my family's pictures or I would see him in court and I was willing to take him to court in another state about six weeks later I got a package and it was bubble wrapped and in it were the photos that I had requested. And I actually have my photo of my uncle. Even though I don't know who he's with, I have the photo. Dencho has a copy of it um, that they have on their website, but I got my family photo back. Um, that's why it's important that families not just give up, not just say our stories are gone, we can't find it. There are ways to find it, there are means to find it, and it's important that places like eBay and Dead Fred and things like that don't sell it because it's not theirs to sell. So that's my story. That's my family's photo. And I will show you the photo because the gentleman also sent me one other photo. So this is my uncle. And this is the photo that I fought hard to get. And then also he sent me this photo which is a photo of our family farm wow where we picked berries wow. so that was very important to me because those were two things that nobody in my family had ever seen and since then we have made copies because all of my cousins i have 27 cousins and all of us want our family story so we all have a photo album that is 
our Maximoto family album. And as we find photos, then we put them in there. So our children and our children's children will know who they are and who they came from. And Sezo is a very important person because he did a phenomenal thing. He came to America as a Ryukusan. He was a scholar sent by the Miji government during the Reformation to study the American infrastructure. And he chose to stay here and become an American. And it was very important to him to be an American. And he loved America. So what happened to him was just atrocious. It was atrocious what happened to all of us, all of our family members. But for him, it they say it broke his heart. And that's what he died of, was a broken heart. And my goal is to make that heart pain feel better, heart break feel better, because I want nobody to ever experience what he spent, he had to go through. So can you tell us, I know this is a little because, you know, having to have threatened legal action, but can mm -hmm. you tell us a little bit about the person who had your family photos, where they got them um, and kind of what they were doing with them? He is, he was an affluent individual. He's deceased now. Um, and he had a private collection. He claimed to be a, a scholar and a peer to the Japanese American community um, in his lifehood, lifetime. But the more I've found about him, the more I've discovered he wasn't truly a friend. He, he used his affluence to intimidate and to do things that weren't necessarily fair or right to the Japanese American community. Um, he bought the photo from another individual um, because he had a collection of Japanese American memorabilia. And it ranged from photos to pieces of furniture to China, just anything that belonged to a Japanese American family in and around Tacoma and Seattle. And that was his, that was his thing is like collecting, you know, Hummel figurines, his was collecting Japanese American artifacts that had belonged to families in and around the Tacoma, Seattle, Fife area. And so he had gotten the, those photos from an individual and purchased them off them for his private collection. Do you know what happened to the rest of his collection? I do not. Um, I've inquired at several libraries to see if it's been presented to a library as a personal collection for historical facts. Um, but as of yet, I have not seen anything in the local surrounding libraries come with his name attached to it. Um, I'm assuming that maybe the family is keeping it or maybe the family is doing the right thing and trying to contact families and say, hey, we have part of your family's pictures. We have some of your artifacts. Do you want them back? I, I, I hope they're doing the good, but, you know, I just I can't say yes, they are or no, they aren't. Did you have any more contact with him after he sent the parcel of photos I, to you? I did. He actually um, sent me a brief manuscript of what he was trying to write. He, he had decided he was going to write a story about some of the families that he had artifacts from. Um, and he sent me his rough manuscript about my family's story. Um, and... I had to discredit him on several things because he didn't have dates right. He didn't have names right. He didn't have spelling right. And I told him, you know, I would really choose that if you're going to do this, that you do it right, or you just remove my family's name entirely. Um, and that was basically the last communication we had. And shortly thereafter, he passed away. So I, the book, it's gone. So I don't have to worry about that. And he has gone on to a better place, I hope. So is there any advice you would give to other family members who may find themselves in the same situation as you? Not to give up. I know our typical belief is, you know, we, we don't give up, but don't give up on not finding your story, not discovering your story because it's out there. The internet is a huge opportunity now and there are laws that, you know, protect us. And there is legislation that is being enacted in different states to help us. Um, so just don't give up. Look, you know, and reach out. If, if you find something, if it's Den Show, if it's Jay, 
if it's the Japanese American Cultural Society in San Francisco, wherever it may be, you can reach out and communicate and have that conversation and you never know where it's going to lead you. I mean, you may get somebody that's going to say, yeah, that's your family story. Here you go and give it back to you. You may have to, you know, be a little tougher, but at the end of the day, being able to see that small piece of your story is it's huge. It, it's the fire that helps you go a little bit further each time, I think. So I, I say, don't give up. What would you say to, um, a non-Japanese American person who has um, come into possession of these objects like these? I'd be inquisitive. I would want to know how you, you know, how did you acquire them? Where did you find them? You know, what are you going to do with them? You know, have you thought about maybe, you know, presenting these to a museum as, you know, for a cultural exhibit? Have you thought about maybe sharing this, you know, with your local library for an exhibit? Um, what, what's your purpose in keeping this? Are you going to help expand the knowledge or is it just for your own personal gain? Um, and, you know, I would lovingly do that, but my hope would be that whoever did it, that they would, you know, want to help encourage the education about whatever it is that they have whether it be a Ming Dynasty vase or it be a kimono, you know, from somebody's family, just, you know, sharing that knowledge is huge. So, so you're fine with objects either going into public institutions or going back to the family. Do you have a preference? I prefer them to go back to the family. If it, if you can find the family, I think that it just like they're doing in Europe with Japanese American or not Japanese American with the Jewish communities, artifacts, and family memorabilia. I think if we can find the families that those artifacts and those pieces of memorabilia and stories belong to, I think we should return them. I, I think that's the best way to heal what has happened um, for all of us. But uh, ultimately, if you can't do that, then encourage growth and education and knowledge and share it with a museum, share it with a local library, you know, share the knowledge to ensure that nothing like this ever happens again. A lot of the discussion and dialogue has centered around objects made in the incarceration camps mm -hmm. um, during that 1942 to 1945 period, um, arts and crafts that were made. Right. Your story is a little different in that they were family photos Right. And that um, they were removed f from your potentially from your family home mm -hmm. uh, during the war years that had, they'd been there since pre-war. Right. right. Does your family have many objects from pre-war times? As far as family memorabilia, artifacts or belongings pre-war, we have nothing. There's nothing to show um, that we had a flower shop. There's nothing to show that we had a laundry service. There's nothing to show that we had a small grocer that, you know, my great grandfather would drive around a model T and deliver flowers to families in Tacoma daily. Um, we have nothing to show for any of that. Um, it's all gone. So yeah, there's nothing pre-war that exists for our family. So you've been gathering all of this family information. You've got a busload of cousins I do. Um, who are curious and wondering about their heritage and family history. What are your next steps now? Now you've recovered some of these photos. W what are you going to do? I am actually in the process of trying to publish a book called From Sezo to Saranya. And it is the story from him from my great grandfather to my generation telling our family's story and what occurred and how our lives have changed since leaving Japan and coming to America and becoming American. And that is our next step is getting our family's story published and into libraries, into schools to help teach children about the Japanese American history within our country and how strong it is and how beautiful and fruitful it is and teaching them also the travesties that have occurred so that we never have that happen again. For me, I would encourage 
every single person as they go through this and they look and see that they're, you know, they're missing a piece of their story. There, there's knowledge out there. Um, there's different aspects that you can gain it, whether you want to hunt for your family photos if, or if you want to just learn about your family's story. There's opportunities, there's pilgrimages, there's historical reading. Um, I encourage everyone to learn or embrace your family story. I know our elders have kept it quiet. I, I feel a lot of it through shame and the fact that it was undignified. But I feel like as third generation, fourth generation and on, it's important that we learn our story, we tell our story, and we share our story to educate everybody. Um, and I think that's just important beyond all belief that every single person should understand and be able to embrace and love their family for the resilience and the strength that they were able to exhibit in such hard times. Great. So our first one up is I'd like you all to think about and give feedback on these couple of questions. We hear often from people uh, pushing back on um, why the capitalism of sales of objects is wrong. Some of the things we hear are, why shouldn't these items just be sold to the highest bidder? Let the market decide who should have them. Shouldn't owners be able to sell them or do whatever they want with them if they have them? And why should anyone else have a say in who gets these items? It's a, it's a hard, there's no black and white answer. There's no right or wrong answer. I mean, obviously each family has to decide for themselves. I, I just can come at it from the perspective of uh, a Yonsei and just say that um, if these items aren't shared with the rest of the community, whether it's um, by donating to a museum or you just keep it yourself and you um, have it within your family, it really kind of makes our, I shouldn't say that, it helps our history along to disappear. Um, you know, these items end up kind of just scattered to the wind. They might be thrown away. They might be um, just kept in somebody's private collection above their toilet. You know, like there, there's so much to learn from all of these. And because the event that we're talking about is still within, you know, one lifetime, I think we devalue them because it's not like 300 years ago. Oh my God, look at this. Um, so I, I just feel like uh, understanding how precious they are, just as they are, as a memento, as a, a memory, as a something that an ancestor created, but then also how much it means to us younger generations and thinking about Gose, Rokuse, whatever comes after that, what will they have to be able to look at, see, um, feel, because they will have, I mean, by the time you get to Rokuse, I don't know if they will even have met Nisei. And so how, how do you have that connection? You know, I just feel like it, it, it's erasure. Um, I think that, first of all, in, um, when you talk about auctions and sales, particularly auctions, these are economic transactions that determine the market value, right? You compete and then the highest bidder wins. And to just put these historical artifacts in the category of something to be bought, traded, sold is wrong because certain objects have moral value. For example, there's um, it's against the law to sell. There's an embargo on elephant ivory. Um, public lands, you can't do anything to them that you want. And I think that new categories are being formed for artifacts, which people agree are beyond the sort of typical capitalist, if I have enough money, I can buy it. So for example, Native American artifacts from grave sites, um, Holocaust items, items from that have resulted, that were um, meant to capture and keep enslaved people, black people, for example. Some of these items, we say, no, that's morally wrong. They should not be sold. And I think that Japanese American items fit into that category because of racism. These are objects of racism. 
and they may look beautiful, but let's look at the barbed wire, not just the beauty. And um, I think by having these protests against the sale of our historical objects, which were made by our ancestors, our parents, our grandparents, our great grandparents, we are reclaiming those stories and those artifacts and sharing them with society because they belong to society. And by having them held privately, you exclude them from the bigger story. And um, that's what's, what's happening now, I think, in society is let's get these stories out there. And if you hold them privately and think that the person with the most money gets to scoop them all up and put them away or burn them or keep them or do whatever they want, then um, you're not going to have a public history anymore. I kind of agree with what Nancy said. I mean, if we're going to let capitalism decide who gets to learn history, who gets to have history, then we're we're taking away education. We're taking away and we're creating a new form of education is only entitled if you have enough money and there and then you're going to rewrite education because it's going to fit within the parameters of that economic branches decisions. It's not the true history. It's going to be washed. It's going to be gentrified. It's going to be prettified and taken away from its true meaning. Um, best example I can give is this week I was talking with a young woman and she is like, oh, I can't wait to go to Japan and I'm going to wear, I'm going to dress up like a geisha. Well, okay. Um, you can go to Japan and you can have the opportunity to wear kimono but there's a there's steps there's there's a history a very rich history and a very detailed history on how you present kimono how it's worn how it's structured it's not just a costume and when we let somebody just buy it it's it's maybe just a costume it's maybe just because it's pretty they don't know the value they don't know the history and we can't let that happen to our history it was taken away we have to reclaim it from a personal standpoint, um, seeing my dad's drawings, uh, seeing his sketches on eBay, and knowing they're out there being sold, it really, um, it's really sad. It really makes me sad that these, some people are profiting from someone else's pain of what they went through. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just absolutely wrong that this is happening. And if sellers can check and verify where these artifacts came from, I think they should do that and take the right steps to try and return them back to their families. And, and I think, um, Lori, by raising the question of provenance with the Rego auction, it wasn't clear um, how he obtained them. In some cases, they were given to him. In some cases, we know that he paid a small amount. And in some cases, he removed things from the camps after they were closed. But the point is that some they, they all of these objects trace back to somebody yes. and when you're a seller you're not allowed to sell things whether you're Sotheby's or Christie's if you can't prove the ownership trail the mm -hmm. provenance and some of these cases with the things that are for auction if we don't know exactly where they came from with the Kitaji Bibles the family thought that it was in the family's hands and it's a very large family and then the question is well how did they end up in Swan Gallery's um, possession and then once you start looking at that, the same thing with eBay's, um, the Matsumura drawings, um, I think that it would be interesting to try and find out how that person um, obtained them. And then with Rego, that was one of the purposes of that, stopping that auction was he said, please just put a pause on this so we can find out if living people actually have a claim to these artifacts. Right. You know, there has been... Um, a lot of discussion about um, value and, you know, much of the antique business and collectible business is about buying low and selling high. And so there actually is market manipulation that goes on and it's kind of the treasure seekers. And many of the auction shows that you see now, um, it's really about that. Who's, who's found a deal? Who scored a deal? To me, it appears that there's an intrinsic um, or inherent uh, flaw in this when it relates to objects of, of, of oppression. And um, 
I'm curious about what individually your thoughts are about these objects being removed from their initial manufacturing or creation to all of a sudden become more of a commodity, like old Fiesta dinnerware or a Louis IV chair. Are these objects similar to those? Or is there something really intrinsically different about that? For me, fiesta wear, reproduction, Louis, Louis the Fourth chairs, things like that, those are mass produced. A lot of times these things that are being sold are, are individually produced. They're individually lovingly created through time and effort and skill and travel oceans and seas and you know, it's from the heart. It's somebody's family's creation and to just like sell it, it just, that's, it just hurts. I mean, that's the best way to put it is to see Lori's family, you know, her family members' sketches and drawings just being sold to the highest bidder, you know, and being taken my family photos just being sold. I don't understand why somebody would even want to do that. Why wouldn't you want to send them back to where they belong? That's my opinion. Right. It's so hard to get them back. You know, mm -hmm. it's like, I don't agree with paying to get our family, family's belongings back to me. Yeah. That's just not right. During the Rego auction, I remember um, people were saying it feels like we're paying a ransom. Mm -hmm. uh, I felt like I was being held for ransom when I was told to pay for my photos. It, it, <sighs> it, it was like you, you kidnapped my history, my family's history, and I have nothing. And now you're telling me in order to have that tiny bit of my family back, I have to pay you? You kidnapped something that wasn't even yours to begin with. I mean, you basically stole it. And now I have to pay you and I have to be thankful to pay you to get my belongings back. It just doesn't make sense to me. So auctions don't make sense to me either. And knowing that they're just going to the highest bidder just hurts my soul. Now you, Kim, if I understand correctly, um, mm -hmm. didn't get a response until legal action was either taken we or We went back or? and forth and he, I, my response was pay me. If you want them back, pay me. You can pay me. I paid for them. You can pay me. And I finally just said enough is enough. I'm not paying for something that you shouldn't even have to begin with. And I went and I cited, you know, that you have artifacts and you will return them. There is law that stipulates you have to return this. And I was willing to take him to civil court if necessary because I felt really, really wronged and shamed that somebody had stolen them and then he was now selling them. It didn't make sense. He knew. He knew that there was family members. He knew that there was family that wanted them back, that he could have willingly given them to at any time and instead he chose to sell them. And again, one of the things that I think I'm trying to get at as is, and Kim kind of touched on this, is the difference between mass-produced, kind of industrial, manufactured mm -hmm. things. People collect belt buckles or watches or, you know, things that were made potentially for a long time right. versus the nature of these. But I think that that also doesn't quite answer the artwork. What makes somebody who took a painting class in 1950 in Kansas City, what makes that art different than something that was produced behind barbed wire on a scavenged piece of paper? I think that when um, you focus on the piece only, mainly as an artwork, then you're kind of removing the history, the context, and the circumstances of why it was made. And it almost kind of implies that the creation, um, the impulse was to create beauty. And okay, you want to make something nice, but it's essentially prison art. Mm -hmm. And by focusing on the technique and the 
the beauty of it, which is, you know, part of it and what it is, you're stripping away the why and the how and the who, as a matter of fact. Um, and that's what I think is important for us to understand so we can make sure this never happens again, that people lost everything. And so you can see the act of making something as an act of recovery in a way. And I think also that just because something is handmade doesn't intrinsically make it more important because I'm thinking of in our project 50 Objects, um, there is an immigrant man who was given a gold pocket watch um, after Pearl Harbor as a retirement gift by his employer who really appreciated his work. And that Issei man took it to um, two assembly centers and to Heart Mountain. He was married to a Mexican-American slash um, Native American woman who was an American citizen. They had five multiracial children. They were separated and then he died. And the only th one of the only things the family still has generations later is that gold pocket watch. So that was made by a machine, but it still has really soulful, important historical value for that family. And or I a think, photograph. Yeah, I mean, it, it's not so much, it's an arts and crafts item. It's, you know, created in dress. It's the fact it has a story, it has a history, it has a semblance to the person. And when you sell that, you're, you're selling it as a thing. You're just, you're putting it out there. It has no meaning. It has no value. It's just an empty cusp. But to those of us that have that story, know that story, it means the world. It, it is the world, truly and honestly. And that's the thing that I think is forgotten when they auction off these things and they sell them is to you, it's a thing and it's going to the highest bidder and it's the best dollar that you can get profit for. But to us, it's timeless. It's it transcends everything because it takes us to that family member. It, it connects us to something that we don't have the opportunity to have. And I mean, it's a family member. Yeah, and, and that's it. And especially in Lori, your case. I mean, I was happened to watch Antiques Roadshow last night, and they said this was estimated to be worth two thousand dollars in two thousand, and now they update it. Mm -hmm. And then they show you, did the value increase or decrease? And then when they show that the value went to from 2000 to say $700, it plays kind of sad music. Yeah. And I mean, you could do that with Japanese American artifacts. Mm -hmm. What's the price today? What's the market say? No, we don't want that. And Lori, exactly. I think you can really speak to that because it's your father's drawings. Uh, to me, it's priceless because I don't have many things of my dad mm -hmm. left and he's gone, he died. So to me, having these, his artwork means more than, than anyone else, you know, a non-family member. And because I can show that it's his and with the name and the man's and our name on there, I think it's only right that they should be returned. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't be made into a big deal. I mean, just it's the right thing to do. In Japanese, I was always taught the word chanto. I don't know if you guys grew up with that word, but <laughs> oh my goodness, every time I, I'm doing something over my shoulder, I can hear my aunt, oh, do it chanto. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, it should be the right way. Yeah. And, and I think that's what we need to remember. It, sh it should be the right way. It means just do the right thing. Do it the right way. Don't don't take away what's not yours. Don't, don't sell our stuff. Don't, don't profit from our hurts. I mean, I think that's the biggest thing is, you know, Lori can look at those images and that each brush stroke, each, you know, shape and art. I mean, each piece has a semblance and meaning that is so intense for her. I'm sure, you know, that it's something that nobody else can understand. And so just to take that and, take it away from her, it's like you're basically robbing her of her own family and that person every time they do that. And that's not right. And also, I'd like to know how the seller received these artworks. <laughs> that's another thing. How did you get those? Where did you get those? 
I, I have so many questions mm -hmm. that have gone unanswered. And I really would like the answers. And I think, and I think I, I mean, I think I deserve to know how he got those. I agree. <laughs> Sad part is though, is they don't always want to share that with us. They just tell us that they got them through another illicit means and leave it at that. Or in my case, he wouldn't tell me who was the seller originally because no, I would just, love to find out they had more. It comes down to money mm -hmm. and that's unfortunate. It's all it about is. money. So, you know, one, one of the things that strikes me, um, is that, you know, a lot of white folks profited in 41, 42, as people were forced to break down their homes and their businesses and get rid of items in really short order, not knowing for how long, not knowing where they were going. Um, so many questions out there that for me, it's very aggravating to see white folks attempt to profit off of the World War II experience of Japanese Americans for profit. Um, and I'm curious, um, do you, for you, is there a difference between somebody who is Japanese American who is getting rid of something potentially that they inherited it or somebody who found it at a garage sale and saw it for five dollars but knows or thinks they can get five hundred dollars for it <laughs> I, i'm just trying to figure like it because it's it's such a I, I i keep coming back to it being such a gray issue it, it just there is no there is no like one size fits all answer to everything but you know i can and this is going to like be a little bit of a a detour on what we were just talking about, but I do feel like some of it is also on our own community yeah. to teach the importance of what happened. I know obviously historical trauma, people didn't talk about it. And, but Lori, you said something in your interview that kind of struck a chord with me. You said that your grandmother, had such so little that she would not have wanted to give that give it away that she clearly would not have done that uh you know purposefully and it really just made me think about um what happened people losing their their livelihoods their homes their possessions and then you know we kind of joke about this like multanai with the ni with the nisei and how you know they just saved everything and it's all shoved into you know, a giant garbage heap in a garage. And I could understand how Sansei would, you know, maybe see all of that and go, whoa, I just somebody take it. Because I think that's what happens a lot of times with eBay. It's estate sales. It's just like, mm -hmm. clear it out. I don't want to go through it. Maybe it's too painful for me to go through it. Clear it out. But, you know, if, if even like Sansei don't realize and I think sometimes it's hard when you're that next generation. It's, you know, you kind of get that, oh, mom, dad, mm, you know, whereas with, with you know, us, it's like, oh, grandma, grandpa, you know, that was something grandpa made. Um, I think it, it has a little bit of a different uh, emotional attachment to it. But I do think it's kind of up to our community as well to teach them, like, how important, how precious these items are. Because you know, a lot a lot of kids don't know. They have no idea. They don't know what what this means, and and so they might inherit something and just go, ah, whatever. It's just a bunch of papers. I, and and I'm sure that happens. I'm sure that happens to everything. I mean, there every community has that right where somebody just like inherits something. And go, I don't. I have no use for this. It's just it's garbage. And that's why they be, end up becoming precious 200 years later because the one that didn't get thrown away, it's like, oh, here it is. And I just think that if we are can mobilize as a community on both sides, like get, encouraging people to not sell them, encouraging people to not buy them, um, that what an amazing way to coalesce the community to preserving our own history. Like here it is, we've got it. A hundred years from now, check it out. Five hundred bird pins right here. You know, and, and, and really it sounds need silly. To. Yeah, but it's like you know, it's a, it's a, it's. I I feel like we have the 
the momentum and the people that are willing to kind of start this. And I don't know if any other community culture has done this before. I'm not going to say, oh, we're like the first, but what what a way for because we're such a small group of people, really, relatively in the United States. Um, you know, even amongst like Japanese Americans, like many are Shin and they don't have this the, the same issue. Um, that like what an opportunity to be able to as a community keep these within the community or at least in in institutions that serve our community so that we can, you know, like generations down the road, people can still see something that was made, you know, drawings that were made in camp, uh, uh, carving, you know, photographs like that. That's just a much, I think, a much more meaningful way to honor your ancestor. Maybe you can't keep it, can't keep everything, you know, but for them to have their photograph, your family photograph in a museum that other kids can go, oh, look, there's great, 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 great grandpa or whatever, or look, that's somebody that looks like me, you know, or anything like that. I just think that that's, it's so incredibly precious. And I don't think most of us think of it that way. You know, everybody here does, right? but I think general, general people just kind of look at it like, oh, it's just, it's stuff. Like even on our own thing, you know, even on our own things, it's stuff. I just want to get rid of it. I don't, you know, and it's like, but some of us find it like, that's like precious. Yeah. You know? I've I, seen I a it. lot of my friends going through that as CNC. And it's the one thing I've heard a lot is it's overwhelming. And it's what do I keep? What don't I keep? Because there was so much. And a lot of them are having to like really dig in and dig under and make the decisions of what what is going to be beneficial to my kids 10 years from now. What is going to be beneficial to my grandchildren 10 years from now? And that's how they're deciding. And the things that they don't see as beneficial, a lot of them are trying to find the Japanese, you know, museums and the places where they can put those things that they don't necessarily feel has that family, you know, intrinsic value, but still has that rich history that they can share with others who don't necessarily have that history. And so I've seen several friends recently expressing, you know, I'm overwhelmed, I'm stressed out by it, but I know I have to. And so I think that's a huge change. And I know in Tacoma, I feel like there's actually motion and movement for them to create those opportunities to share those things, to create exhibits, um, to educate people with those things that, you know, you may not want, but may help that child, you know, that doesn't have that history understand, oh, look, that person was here and they looked like me and, oh, that's something from my culture. And so it's like opening a door that they didn't necessarily have before. And I think they're starting to do that, but I think it's like in small little increments. It's not, it's not like we would like it to be where it would be a bigger, you know, cross country, you know, effort. It's little patches here and there that are trying to build the momentum for it. And I wish that we could like pull all of our resources and do it together. I think the more um, that you, for example, Kim, or mm -hmm. people who are um, getting rid of their family objects, to the extent that they can get the story with any living relative or a family friend, and write it down or hold up your phone and record it, that is information that once they're gone, it's lost forever. Mm -hmm. So it's not just saving the artifact, but it's as much as possible trying to get the story so it has meaning and two generations from now, it won't just be literally a thing that no one knows about, like these albums, which have faces, but no names attached to them. Right, But it's also on our community to kind of figure out lots of different avenues and ways for people to donate things. And, you know, it costs money to archive these things and process mm -hmm. them and store them. We run out of space. And I think increasingly we'll probably need to be thinking about how to train members of our own community on how to, when you want to donate it somewhere, you present a lot of context, photographs, letters. So when you donate it somewhere, 
they don't have the resources to do that kind of research, which for you, it's your family history. Mm -hmm. And then also maybe think of places that are not necessarily Japanese American only, but you know, your local historical society, um, um, a, a public library, sometimes they will have nothing about this. And when it's executive order 9066, when it's day of remembrance, they may want to bring it out, but they won't have anything. Whereas other museums are just over, you know, are overwhelmed with things. Right. So we need to kind of on our community, um, you know, figure out ways for people to deal with all this stuff that you mentioned. Yes, I agree. Piggy, piggybacking on that a little bit, it reminds me of talking to a couple of um, National Park Service sites um, about dressers. So in camp, no furniture, you know, you had to make your own mattress. Um, so virtually nothing. So a dresser was one of the things that was a shape or a function that there were hundreds of them made at every camp. Everybody needed to store their clothes. Some of those things came back from camp and went into garages or basements or spare bedrooms. Um, some were undoubtedly left behind. Um, but how many dressers does a National Park Service site or museum really can they take and house? And so then all of a sudden, what happens to all of these dressers? People know that they were made in camp, may know who made them in camp, but who's going to store it? Who's going to take care of it? So I think that that's, those are also real world challenges. And I think as people go and may go to their, the closest Nikkei institution that deals with history, community history, and says, I have a dresser, and they're met with the response of, I get 50 dressers offered up to me every other year. We, we don't have any more. What does that tell the family? What's the family supposed to do with that bit of information? Are they, you know, we need to try and help people understand. Then you move on to the next one. Mm -hmm. You know, you keep looking, especially... For me, one of the huge costs with the selling of these items are the losing of the stories and the people who were involved with them, which always makes an historic object so much richer. It's not just an apron. It's the apron of Masa, who worked at this store, at this address for these years, who had these children, who immigrated at this time and was imprisoned at this time, at this mm -hmm. camp. Things are so much richer when you have a name attached. And that is one of the first things that's lost. So like even with Lori's objects, we're trying to find the Matsumura that made those drawings there aren't many that it could be, but we're researching. What if those pictures only had Manzanar on them? The word Manzanar. Then we wouldn't have known where they came from. Yeah. I wouldn't know they were my father's. I wouldn't have known that. Right. But so. they would have still intrinsically held some value, but not as much because they don't have the artist and everything else. And I still think they would hold value, but not it would just be a question mark and it may just again be stuck in somebody's closet or somebody's museum not knowing what it is and i think that's you know where we need to like really put forth the effort like you said of it's masuras it's you know it's kamikos and this is their story and this is why it's important those are the things that need to be shared like with the dresser you know i saw a friend um, he took his family's camp trunk and he took his family's photos and the few photos he had, he put them in the lid of that trunk. I saw that post. Yes. And now <laughs> everything for his family, that's, you know, historical, memorable for any of them for coming future generations goes into that trunk. That's huge. It's creating like this lifeline to something that would have been possibly just cast aside, but now it's going to become invaluable because it's going to carry that family story through so many generations. I almost wonder if these pilgrimages 
for example, the Minidoka pilgrimage, you know, adopts a project where next year we're talking about how many dressers or trunks we've saved, how many stories yeah. are now attached to them, how many schools or local historical societies or local Nikkei societies have we placed them, you know, and if it's something that, oh, a museum can't take it or the National Park Service can't take it, then maybe they are used for educational purposes mm -hmm. in an elementary or middle school. Each pilgrimage could do their own, you know, community. Project. That would be amazing. Like a trunk project, like everybody brings Okay, my family is at Minnedonka. So I now have a trunk and I create my family story within that trunk and share. And share. That would be right. huge. So, so then you contribute your own family artifact, you preserve that history, and mm -hmm. then you share it with the community. And I think the fact that we're having this conversation shows that even since the Rego auction six years ago, when people were going, an auction? Rich people have, uh, well, this is really, you know, this is going to be an auction in um, New Jersey. It's like, I've never been in a real auction where you raise your paddle or you mm -hmm. phone in a bid. And, you know, eBay is one thing, you know, what, what, and why is um, our stuff so valuable that it's going to be listed at these high prices? And, mm -hmm. and so it took a while for people to kind of understand what's at stake and why it's ne necessary to have a protest. But once the social media got involved, you know, thousands, 8,000 people signed this change.org petition. And it was just amazing. It was like people were lining up to say their family name, sign the petition and say they were at Gila River. They were at Manzanar. My parents were in Hawaii. I never met my grandfather because he went back to Japan. And each each signature behind it was a personal testimony. And so I think, you know, then when the Kitaji Bibles came up for sale two years later, that family could mobilize in three days, find 30 family members, sign a letter. And frankly, that those Bibles, which were going to be sold for $85,000, mm -hmm. I think personally that they weren't on the public market, they were privately being sold, was possibly because um, they might have feared public pushback. And so, um, and then recently with the Matsumura drawings on eBay, um, there was a cons there's a consortium now, the Japanese American Confinement Site Consortium. And in one day, when Biff, you were a part of this, and Kimiko, you know, everybody here was a part of that. In one day, you got over 100 organizational representatives to sign on, a whole bunch of, you know, individuals, and um, were able to meet with eBay about this. So it, it, it shows progress. And I think that's something positive we can be take heart in. Two, two points. Um, one, something that Dr. Bonnie Clark made uh, a point uh, at the Amachi pilgrimage a few weeks ago is she said, um, you know, just because an institution might have a lot of one object, like something small, basically not something as big as a dresser, but let's just say, you know, again, bird pins, um, doesn't mean that they might not still take yours because there is value also for students to be able to actually handle objects. So if they have extra, like sure, there'll be some that will be, you know, very well preserved, but Others, if they have extra, they could actually hold them, look at them, look closely at them. And that that gives a whole different type of uh, learning, you know, and maybe it's for specifically for archaeology students or something like that. But, uh, you know, I think there are ways that you can discuss with institutions, not necessarily like a really large museum, but maybe a, a more smaller local one. Um, another point that I would want to make is also if we can also get out of the mindset of that it has to be a JA group, a JA museum, because we're talking about American history. Mm -hmm. Every American should know it. Every American yes. should have access to it. So if, if you know, one large institution on the West Coast can't take it, what about some small American history museum in, in Iowa? There was no campsite there. They probably have got nothing. But would it hurt to to approach them and say, I have this, this was made in a in a concentration camp during World War II. Is it something that you would like to have in your collection? Because we all know there are hundreds of thousands of people out there who've got no clue. Mm -hmm. And if there's even one thing in a museum that they might see or a kid might see at a field trip and go, what's that? You know, well, one of the ideas that came out of the Rego auction was, gee, maybe there's a need for a clearinghouse. 
In other words, you know, one spot nonprofit that says, okay, send us, t send us a description and you'll have a, a protocol or a, a yeah. form to fill out. What is it? Tell us a story. And then you, you, you know, collect this stuff and you're the, you're the, pl the point person or the place where you're collecting things so they don't get sold or thrown away, but you're also the person who would help distribute them to educational institutions. That'd be huge. Yeah, what a gift that would be to the community. I mean, just to, just to have like a clearinghouse to say, hey, you know, we're studying, you know, World War II and we're, we're doing, you know, our session on, you know, the imprisonment camps of Japan or Japanese citizens. Is there anything you can provide to maybe even educational, you know, curriculum, like a teacher that we can use to personify that education segment to where kids understand it. Cause let's think about it. When they read history, it's in a book. It's, you know, it's a story. It's a, a consolidated story that they touch on and then they have to move on to the next era. But if they had something to say, Hey, wait a minute, kids, I want to show you this item that was created by this individual during that it would it would turn a child's mind into history a little bit further than just glancing through the pages i mean it would be something they could see feel touch and know that somebody else made that and think about the effort it took and the talent and the the person's story that would to take and make history real for them would be huge and I think that would create an even further change because that kid would remember that and it would carry them on into their adulthood. And it would probably change a lot of perspective, I think, when it comes to history. It's funny because I remember, you know, during during school, I didn't really learn about the Japanese internment camps. I only knew it because my family were in mm -hmm. them, but we were never really taught that in school. It was kind of glossed over. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it was like, oops, yeah, we put Japanese people in an internment camp. So let's go on to the next chapter. I mean, that was it. Right. So and I think if, if we can educate the next generation and keep educating them and point things out, I think it would be wonderful to, yeah. in some way to do that. And I keep, you know, if it weren't, it's funny because if it weren't for my, my grandfather, Mm -hmm. And having to go down and take the DNA test in in um, Inyo County, it's sad to say, but I don't know if I would drive that far to see Manzanar. Mm -hmm. But now my eyes are open and I see the importance of it. So it's kind of, I was on one end, but now I'm on this end. And, and now it's, I want to tell my niece and nephews, you have to, you have to learn, you have to go. So when I'm telling them, you have to tell your children. So it's never forgotten. Exactly. And for me, my story was told, you know, in, in, a, in a room, my grandma, it was very quiet. It was, you know, this is why you look the way you look. This is why you're different. And that's how I learned who I was and why and what happened. And, you know, I made that promise to her that, I was going to tell our family story. I was going to be loud. I was going to be proud. And I was going to do anything I possibly could to complete that circle because it shouldn't be something hidden and kept away. And, you know, as I got older and I start learning history and it's like, oop, we did this and let's go to the next chapter. You know, I'm sitting there going, oh, uh, wait a minute. There, there's more to this story than you're coming and through with, you know, and it was really hard to be that one little Asian girl, you know, or half or half or whatever you want to call me sitting there in this classroom of white kids going, um, I have something to say because you're not telling the true story. You know, that was scary, you know, and that is what I think needs to change because if some child somewhere hears just that tiny bit of somebody else's story, it makes it real and it makes it change. And I think that's what this is all about is making that change for them. So, you know, I, I don't want another kid to sit there and go, why do, why do my eyes turn up to the sun? Why is my hair dark? You know, I, I don't want a kid to sit there and question themselves because I know I did. And, you know, if somebody had been able to say, this is why before my grandma did, it would have meant the world to me. So, you know, I think history and sharing that through a clearinghouse to where, you know, you loan it out and then you send it back. 
I think that would be huge. I know they do it with like um, World War II uh, veterans. They like have like a, there was like a storybook that they were doing, like it was virtual for a few years where they were like taking the story of soldiers and putting it into like um, a, a, a display that they could like send, you know, a packet of soldier stories to like classrooms to tell those soldier stories. Why couldn't we do that with some of our Japanese artifacts, our Japanese American artifacts and our stories? Wouldn't that be amazing? That would I mean, be. it would just change, I think, so much. As somebody who went to school in the Midwest and granted many, many, many years ago. Oh, it wasn't um, that long ago. <laughs> uh, um, for both middle school and high school, more than seven schools in more than three states. I never heard about the incarceration of Japanese Americans in any class, social studies, history, it didn't matter at any school. So I think now on the West Coast, I think it's different for folks, but I constantly remind myself about the South, the Midwest, the East Coast, that they are not, it is not in their face the way that potentially slavery is or, um, you know, the 13 original colonies dominate their historic telling where there's a whole other country. There's much more going on. Um, so there's, there's definitely still a lot of work to be done. Well, I think that is it for my questions. I thank you all. I want to give one last opportunity to each of you. If there's anything more that you want to add on this um, subject or not, or didn't feel like you got a chance to say it, um, or you think is important, at least for people to have in their hopper as they start to think about these things, um, where, where it should go, how it should go, to who it should go, Anything like that, I want to just open it up for folks. I would like to thank Kim and Lori for standing up and fighting for your family's history and the artifact and kind of hanging in there. And um, you're doing it for your family and yourself, but it also helps the community. And it also is a contribution to American society. And so thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I want, I want to tell Lori, I think I'm very proud of you for going after your family's paintings. And, you know, I think that's huge. So I'm very proud of you for doing that. So I know how hard it had to have been. Well, I just want to say I'm, I'm so happy to do these interviews and discussions because I think education is so important. And I... I just really hope that more eyes are open to what's happening and more people will think twice about selling or buying these artifacts. And I'm so glad there's more attention to this, to this situation, to these problems. I agree. <laughs> I, I, it, I can't say it better. <laughs> Um, I would just say that um, it's not in our comfort zone to make waves and it's very scary to do it, um, but we got your back. You know, we there, there are going to be a lot of us who you, you have an issue, you'll have lots of backup. Um, it's not, I don't think it's the same, you know, maybe back 30 years ago when more people would kind of just kind of keep their head down and just be like, okay, that's not my, you know, what we're a lot more mobilized, I think, um, which is awesome. And, and I just think that it's, um, I would also encourage people to go on the physical pilgrimages. I'm a little biased because obviously that's my thing, but, um, the moment and I, you know Lori, i bet you 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 probably know what i'm talking about but you'll talk to somebody but the moment that they actually connect with their family history it's like a light bulb goes off and their face changes and then it's like they get it yes and, and so i hope that we can just by the people we talk to the programs we put on we can just make more of those light bulbs go on in the community 
And I think by breaking the silence, you know, it brings us together here, right? It does, yes. And it gives people um, the opportunity to, to take it to the next step. And even 30 years ago, Kimiko, that was when redress was, you know, and people spoke about it for the first time publicly. And so I think these occasions come when the urge to speak out or to fight for your family history is so strong, you can't be silent anymore. So it's so thank you, Biff, for guiding us in this conversation. Well, thank you all. Thank you all. I think um, I do believe that the work that we can do, the conversations we can start now um, are going to bear major fruit for the community decades down the road and for the generations coming. And I think anything we can do to help that is um, important. Dresser by dresser, bird pin by bird, bird pin. pin, by pin. By <laughs> if that's the way, <laughs> if that's the way, I <laughs> sign up. <laughs> if, it takes, if it takes every little piece, then that's what we'll do. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, you know, until our stories are complete, then that's what we have to do, I think. Well, and I think not leaving your stories to be told and interpreted by other folks, mm -hmm. other communities, because exactly. you don't get the same thing. You don't get the pain, the trauma, the joy, the happiness, the the dreams. All of that stuff gets erased when all of a sudden somebody else starts to interpret your story for you. So I applaud you all and everybody who stands up for the community and their history.